Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm <coughs> Gail Miller. I am um, the president of the Lake County, the Association of Women Attorneys of Lake County. I am also the co-chair for the Paralegal Studies Department here at the College of Lake County. And on behalf of the AWALC, the Paralegal Studies Program of Lake County, the League of Women Voters of Lake County, the AAUW Waukegan Area Branch, and um, the Lake County Bar Association and the Lake County Bar Foundation, I wish to welcome you here this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, we have a lot of sponsors for this, but uh, one thing that I, I'll say is that it's great. Um, all of these organizations find this topic uh, very meaningful and valuable, and uh, we all feel very strongly that this is something we should all be talking about. Um, so that's why I think we have all of these sponsors. So by way of introduction, I'll uh, let those of you, because everybody's coming here from different places. So the League of Women Voters and the AAUW are nonpartisan organizations that seek to influence public policy through education and advocacy. The League of Women Voters believes that democracy is not a spectator sport and good government depends on the informed and active participation of its citizens. The AAUW advances equity for women and girls through advocacy, education, and philanthropy. Here at the College of Lake County, we offer a paralegal studies program, um, and the classes are taught by local attorneys, uh, such as myself, such as my counterpart, Ms. Scott, who is here with us today, such as Sandra Moon, who is here with us today. Um, and the Association of Women Attorneys of Lake County has the mission of promoting equality in education and improving resources for women in Lake County. So you can see a, a, I don't know, a coming together of uh, very similar missions. So I welcome all of you again. Today's speakers, who we have, are Judy Royal and Jane Raley and Christine Bunch. Judy is a co-founder of the Women's Project of the, Cent of the Center of Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern University, while Jane is the legal, the co-legal, co-legal director, so I, didn't, I wanted to get the title right, co-legal director of the Center on Wrongful Conviction at Northwestern University. Um, they, uh, sorry, they, um, they represent, I'm sorry, I'm losing my uh, titles here. We, we rewrote this here. Um, so um, they both focus on public education efforts as well as the representation of center clients, such as Juan Rivera, um, the well-known Lake County case, um, who he was, uh, his conviction was uh, reversed and that led to his release. Christine Bunch is a center client who served 17 years in prison for a crime that turned out to be no crime at all and she will share her story with us today. I'll also add for those of you who are attorneys, there is one credit hour of MCLE and the sheets are available and the sign-in is available outside. Those of you, this is our little housekeeping announcements because I don't want to interrupt mm -hmm. the program. Um, those of you who need to use the restrooms, if you exit here to the right and walk to the end of the hall, the restrooms are also to the right. With that, I will let our wonderful guests begin the program. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Gail. Can you, you can all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, the Center on Wrongful Convictions has um, represented four innocent women in the 14 years since we've been in existence. All four, all four of these women, doesn't hear me? Okay, now I've got it. All four of these women were single mothers convicted of murdering their child. None of them was psychologically disturbed and not one of them had a motive to commit such a monstrous act. Yet all of them had to face criminal charges and then prison instead of being able to properly grieve for their child. All of them were lied to and aggressively interrogated by the police. And all of them to one extent or another had statements that they made to the police used against them either before trial or at trial. 
In actuality, two of these deaths were accidental, and two were murders committed by someone else. Now, of course, not every woman's case is like this, but the coincidence was striking, and it got us to thinking that maybe the factors that are involved in, in wrongful convictions, and this is one of the subjects that the, the General Center on Wrongful Convictions studies quite a bit, the causes of wrongful convictions, that maybe those, can, those causes might play out a little differently or, be, or have different percentages in women's cases as opposed to men. It, it was something at least we thought should be looked at. And actually, the preliminary data suggests just that. For instance, a greater percentage of women are convicted, convicted of harming children or loved ones than is true of, wrongful conviction, of men's wrongful convictions. A greater number of women give false confessions than is true in men's wrongful convictions. A greater percentage of women are convicted in cases in which, in fact, no crime was committed at all, such as in the accidental death of a loved one. So let's look at some of the, these main causes of co the convictions in, in um, women's cases. So you can see you can see what a small number of, of known exonerations are women's cases. Now, of course, women commit a lot fewer crimes than men, but we're talking about exonerations. So you can, you can see, even without, knowing, even without doing any research, you get a sense that, that women are, are under-exonerated, and you wonder, why is that? And I'll tell you one of the main reasons why that is. DNA rarely plays a role in women's, in women's convictions. And you can understand why, why that would be. But for, I know that most of you have read newspaper stories and watched the news, so you understand how the, the DNA cases, DNA has become the gold standard for, for establishing guilt or, in our cases, actual innocence. But what happens in, in cases where, where there is no DNA? Only 15%, only excuse me, over 15% of female exonerees falsely confess to a crime. Nicole Harris was convicted in 2005 of murdering her four-year-old son, Jakari, who died of asphyxiation. He had a mattress pad electric cord around, the, around his neck when he was found in a bedroom that he shared with his five-year-old brother, Deontay, in Chicago. Now, Jakari was really into Spider-Man. He had Spider-Man games. He watched Spider-Man movies. He was really into Spider-Man. And so one day, apparently, he took this elastic part of the mattress pad and, and it was loose and wound it around his neck with the idea of having a cape. Now, his, his brother saw him do this, but his brother didn't understand um, what was happening, and, and Jakari died. The, med the medical examiner ruled that his death was accidental. Now, when, when um, the parents had, had stepped out briefly from the apartment, so neither of them was home. But, so they came home, and the, the child was still barely alive then, so they rushed him to the hospital, where he, was, where he was pronounced dead later on. So they went, to the, they went to the chapel to grieve. While they were in the chapel, the police arrived. They took both parents in, they separated them, they aggressively questioned both of them, trying to get them to either confess or to blame the, the other one. Now, Nicole Harris is actually, she's a, she's a college graduate with a psychology major. You might think that she could She's the type of person who could withstand this type of questioning. But after 27 hours of intermittent grilling, including being kept all night, being separated from her other child and her husband, and she made a, she made a confession. At that point, they went back to the medical examiner who changed the cause of death on the certificate from accidental to homicide. Now, the brother who had been in the room, Deontay, the brother who had been in the room with Jakari, told people what he, what he had observed and that neither of his parents were there. But then there's a whole legal question about um, 
whether he whether his testimony is is reliable or not um, because of his age and so he was he was questioned and he said that he still that he believed in the tooth fairy and Santa Claus and so the, the so the trial judge decided that his testimony should be barred on the basis that he can't distinguish between fantasy and reality well you can understand how absurd how absurd that is because a lot of children of that age believe in Santa Claus, but that doesn't mean they can't accurately describe what they saw in, in, in their bedroom. So with that, with that child not being able to testify, the only evidence that they had was Nicole's confession. So she was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Now, she, later on, the, she wrote to the Center on Wrongful Convictions, and they got involved in the case along with some pro bono attorneys. And ultimately, um, in a habeas action, the Seventh Circuit ruled that the, that the brother's testimony should have been allowed. And charges were, the state ultimately um, dropped the charges against Nicole. And she is out of prison. She's working. She's applying to grad school. And she's spending time with her teenage son, who was five years old when she was arrested. Over 60% of exonerations in women's cases were in cases where it was ultimately found that no, tr no crime had occurred. I'm going to read that again, because this is a pretty stunning statistic. And I'm, and I'm going to tell you about just a few different examples of this. Look at that. And look at, the, and look at the difference with men's cases and women's cases in terms of that statistic. Jennifer Hall was a 20-year-old respiratory therapist in Missouri who was suspected of setting a respiratory therapy room fire in 2011. Despite a lack of motive or clear evidence of arson, the prosecutors argued to the jury that Hall was seeking to be the center of attention by starting a fire that she would then heroically put out. This was why, they argued, she wore her hair curly that day instead of straight as it normally was. She was convicted and sentenced to three years in prison. In 2004, a judge set aside her verdict on the basis of ineffective assistance of counsel for failing to investigate the, the cause of the fire, which showed definitively that the fire started because of an electrical short in a, def in a defective wire. When the state nonetheless decided to retry Hall, the jury acquitted her of all charges. Do you think there are many cases where the prosecutor argues that a change in hairstyle is, uh, is evidence of a man's guilt? In 1989, Patricia Stallings of Missouri was a happily married new mother of her infant son, Ryan. But by the time he reached three months of age, Ryan was colicky and became seriously ill after he ate. When Stallings and her husband took the baby in for tests, the lab report showed the presence of antifreeze in the baby's blood. So Ryan was immediately put in protective custody. There, there was a supervised visit allowed with the mother where she, where she fed the baby again, and the baby died shortly thereafter. So she was, she was arrested. Now the thing is, is she was, she was pregnant at the time she was sent to prison with her second child, gave birth in prison. Then this, the, sec the second child was kept from contact with her. She never got to feed the second, the ba the second baby. The second baby developed the same symptoms that the older brother had. Further testing was done, and it turned out that both of her children had a rare genetic disorder where that causes these, these, this particular illness and gives a false positive in lab work for, for something that's very similar to antifreeze. So she was then, ex she was then exonerated. But this is an, an example of something that we see over and over again in cases 
when a baby or a child dies under mysterious circumstances, they frequently, they, they look to the mother. Even when there's a mother and a father, for some reason, they particularly focus on the mother. But anyways, as I was saying, the mother gets blamed. And even though the people who are experts in this field talk about it, it is very rare for a mother to kill her children without a history of serious mental illness or some sort of um, like postpartum psychosis situation. But if a child, if a child dies mysteriously, that seems to be where the, where the police focus. False or misleading science. Now you can see that this, that this is much higher, again, in women's cases, although it is still a big factor in men's wrongful convictions. So what do we mean by false or misleading science? This means the analysts made unvalidated or false claims unsupported by science. This can include serious errors or misconduct, or sometimes just testifying in a vague or confusing manner. For example, the science can be reliable, but an, innoc but an innocent person can be, can be convicted if the analyst testifies in a slanted way. Like, let's look at the Alejandro Dominguez case, which is a, a Lake County case. Alejandro was 16 years old when he was convicted of rape. There was a very suspect eyewitness identification but also a forensic scientist testified that Alejandro's blood type matched the semen sample found on the victim's body, meaning to the jury that he could have been the perpetrator. But what the scientist did not tell the jury, that two-thirds of men in America also matched that sample. Alejandro was convicted, and, he, and after he was released, he sought DNA testing at his own expense to clear his name. My colleague, Jane Rayleigh, exonerated him, and the DNA testing proved his innocence. The term junk science, which you may have heard, means unreliable science. For example, microscopic hair examinations that are too unreliable and too grounded in subjective opinion to be admissible. Now, I'm not talking about a situation where mitochondrial DNA can be extracted from hair. What I mean is a situation where the way they used to do, and, and actually probably still do in a lot of places, is to have a microscope and look at two hairs under the microscope and decide that whether they think they have similar characteristics. It's very, it's very subjective. Other areas of testimony that are, known to, that are known to be junk science include bite mark comparisons, shoe print comparisons, neither of which has been subjected to rigorous scientific evaluation. And, the, and fingerprints, which people traditionally used to think of as being extremely reliable, are actually a lot more subjective than I think most people realize. Richard Winfrey, Megan Winfrey, 18 years, of old, years old, and her brother Richard Jr. were charged in 2007 with killing a school janitor in rural Texas. All three cases, used the same evidence. Police dogs smelled the victim's clothing and then smelled samples of the Winfrey's clothes. The Winfrey's lived near the victim and knew him slightly. The dogs alerted, indicating that their scents were on the victim's clothes, according to their trainer and handler. In 2004, the FBI itself reported that human scent is easily transferred from one person or object to another, and concluded, identifying someone's scent at a crime scene is not evidence of complicity. In 2005, a second FBI report found limited scientific data to back up dogs' use for human scents. You notice that both of those reports were prior to the Winfrey's arrest. And in 2011, the National Institute of Health found an overwhelming number of incorrect alerts in its own research trials with dogs. Megan and her father both had public defenders at separate trials. 
Both were convicted of murder. Her brother had a private attorney who really went after this evidence, and the jury deliberated for 13 minutes before they acquitted him. That same attorney then exonerated Megan. Megan had a young daughter whom she left with someone when she went to talk to the police originally, thinking she was only going to be gone a few hours. She was arrested on the spot and did not see her daughter again for years. She is now exonerated, trying to rebuild her life, and trying to get custody of her daughter. The biggest controversy right now in the, in the area of changing scientific perspectives and possible wrongful convictions is the subject of what is known as shaken baby syndrome. This refers to the two-part hypothesis that one can reliably diagnose shaking or abuse from three separate findings, which experts refer to as the triad of symptoms. Subdural hemorrhage, that's bleeding under the dural um, layer of the brain, retinal hemorrhages, and um, brain swelling. The other idea is that the um, symptoms onset immediately. So in other words, if a child, baby or child, has these three symptoms, whoever is with them at the time the symptoms show is generally convicted because that, you, you know, you can see how that, how that thinking works. If, this, if these three symptoms mean shaking or shaking and abuse, if the symptoms show immediately, and this babysitter or this mother or this father has the child, they frequently, they, they frequently get convicted. And, um, you know, doctors, most doctors were, were taught now, have been taught in medical school that. Well, the thing is that now um, there's some new thinking on that. I mean, I, I don't think anybody is arguing that babies are not sometimes horribly abused or harmed. We're, but there are, there are two different perspectives now on SBS cases. One perspective is that over the past decade, thinking has evolved that this hypothesis fits poorly with the anatomy and physiology of the infant brain, and that there are many natural and accidental causes for these findings. Also, that the onset of symptoms does not necessarily reliably indicate timing. There's a doctor named Dr. Patrick Barnes, who's a, um, a pediatric neuroradiologist from Stanford. Years ago, he testified for, uh, um, against people in SBS cases. Then he has basically had a complete change of perspective, and he's one of the leading experts now. And he says, you need to ask questions like, did the baby have a preceding infection? Did the baby have bleeding or clotting problems? Were there any other health problems, infections, or problems since birth? Some doctors now also, in addition to Dr. Barnes, think that there is something called a lucid interval. What this means is after the, the harm has occurred, a baby or a child can appear perfectly normal for a period of time and then have a sudden dramatic onset of symptoms. Now there's still some question about whether that means several hours or whether that can mean a few days. There's also some people who talk about there can be um, an earlier injury that gets um, injury and then that area could be re-injured and there could be a slow bleed. There's just, there's a lot of, of new thinking on this. Another area of new thinking and research is some people believe, some scientists have shown in studies that a relatively short fall can cause these symptoms. Now, this was never believed before. But just imagine this case. I mean, if you, a, lot of, you, a lot of times a child falls, or you know, a baby is dropped or falls. And if the injury, if this can cause this type of injury, and then it doesn't show up right away, I mean, you can see how complicated this all is. From before, there was this very nice, simple way of understanding. If you had these three symptoms, the person who had the baby did it. It was very easy. but. Unfortunately, the world is, is, um, is not always that easy. Jennifer Del Pret is a Chicago area daycare worker who was convicted of murder on a theory of shaken baby syndrome. Federal Judge Matthew Canelli recently had um, an extended evidentiary hearing 
where doctors testified on both sides of these issues. And the evidentiary hearing included witnesses about a memo that some Northwestern students had discovered when there was a FOIA request of the police department. And this, this memo was from um, um, the, the main detective in charge of the case, and it was to somebody who was going to testify um, as a state expert. And it said basically, you know, we found out that the, the medical examiner, our medical examiner, and he's going to look at the baby again, that he, he doesn't think it's shaken baby syndrome, and, and he's testified in some other cases about this, and he wants to look at the medical records more. He wants to understand why, try to understand why other people are saying this. And this memo isn't something like where they're saying, hey, let's frame this poor woman. I mean, it wasn't like that. But, I mean, it's, but it's an example of something that was not given to the defense showing that the, the medical examiner, in any event, um, you know, believed that, this, that, that there was a, a very serious misunderstanding of what had happened to this child. And wouldn't it have been great if at that point in time there had been an in-depth look at the baby's health records and it, what, rather than going forward with the case, which is what happened, and this woman being convicted. And, I'll, and um, that, that baby in particular is actually a clearer case than a lot of them because the baby had a number of documented unusual health problems, including un unusual um, expansion of the head circumference and some um, other things that they really think was a, a clot, were signs of a clotting disorder. But this very nice, um, daycare worker, you know, sent to prison, and now she's she's out on bond, and they're still deciding whether or not she is whether or not she is going to be retried. But Judge Canelli ruled that no reasonable juror who had heard all the evidence presented at the evidentiary hearing could have found her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And those of you who are attorneys in the room know how how uh, unusual it is for that particular finding to be made. So here we have SBS, or as sometimes people call it now, abusive head trauma. So there are two completely divided camps, medically and scientifically. There are doctors and scientists who both feel very strongly that they have a correct understanding and that the other side is completely wrong. So what happens in these cases is you have warring experts, which, and, um, how, you know, how will it, and how is a jury supposed to, to sift through the such, you know, some such complex areas when you have completely, you know, completely opposite testimony? And unfortunately, another thing that can happen is, um, particularly in a situation where, you, where you're the mother or the babysitter or the daycare worker for a baby, and that baby suddenly has these unbelievably dramatic symptoms and then dies, or is permanently brain damaged, which happens sometimes too. Can you imagine how upsetting that is? Because you're thinking, what, what happened? Is there something I should have noticed? Did something happen when my back was turned? What, what in the world happened? And imagine how stressed you are, and then you're questioned by the police at, you know, very aggressively, and you might say something like, Jennifer Del Pratt, when the baby went unresponsive, kind of went like, well, like it's gently, like you might to try to rouse a baby, and so then they're like, "Oh, so you admit you shook the baby?" You know, you can you can see how this happens, and so if the person has given a confession or some sort of partially even inculpatory statement, you could see how that could carry the day, and if the jury has testimony on both sides, that person could, you know, could very well be convicted. And this isn't a situation like like DNA where you're going to find something you know, to test that will show 100% what happened. You can look in depth at medical records and you might come up with some very, you know, possible things, but like it's not, it's not like a DNA 100% type of thing. So I, I mean, I think it would be great if there some sort of medical consensus and, you know, could, could develop on at least some of these issues because the criminal justice system, in my opinion anyways, is not the best place to to find the truth in, in that type of situation. And we also would hope that law enforcement and prosecutors would understand the perspective of both, of both sides of this issue because the question on whether to, and to what extent to aggressively question someone or whether to bring, to bring charges, if it's, a, if it's something that 
is unclear what exactly happened or what exactly was involved in the child's health. Once that charging decision is brought, it's, you know, it's hard to, to call it back. So it would be wonderful if, if um, there could be more um, open-mindedness and, and education on this issue. But speaking, speaking of flawed science, um, one of the really dramatic areas of flawed science cases right now are arson cases. My colleague, Jane Rayleigh, the co-legal director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions, has exonerated more people than anyone I know and is the attorney I would most want looking into my case if I were wrongfully convicted of, of a serious crime. And um, Jane is going to talk to you about arson <coughs> cases and her representation of Christine Butch. Thank you very much, and I am thrilled to be here. Um, I have to say that no one person can ever take responsibility or credit for the exoneration of someone who is wrongfully convicted. It truly takes a village, a village of uh, attorneys, non-attorneys, staff members, and um, uh, to give you an example, uh, Judy gave me credit for exonerating Alejandro Dominguez. I did play a role in that case. I managed to obtain for him a pardon based on innocence from the governor. But the bulk of that credit goes to two well-known Lake County attorneys, Jed Stone and John Kernan. They presented the DNA evidence in court that showed that Alejandro Dominguez could not have committed that rape. So again, it takes many people. Uh, it takes a village. And... Um, Christine Bunch was uh, convicted of the arson murder of her three-year-old son in 1996 by a jury. Uh, she was sentenced to 60 years in prison. In December of 2012, uh, charges were dismissed against her, and she sits here now. I am truly honored to have played a part in her exoneration, uh, but many others also played a role. And we'll talk a little bit about this as I talk in more detail about her case. Um, I will be brief because I think you really want to hear from Christine. <laughs> she has a lot to say, and um, she is very articulate and um, very eloquent. Um, uh, so we want to get to Christine. Um, the prosecution of Christine for the murder of her three-year-old son is a tale of mistakes and of misinformation and of evidence that was suppressed and never got to the defense at the time of trial. Um, it's a story of uh, authorities who relied on outdated and disproven theories to wrongly classify an accidental fire as an arson. Um, for decades, arson investigators relied on a collection of beliefs and folk wisdom that was accepted as truth. Um, the ability to call a fire an arson as opposed to an accident was considered an art, not a science. Uh, fire investigators were taught by word of mouth, uh, by mentors who had been investigating fires for decades. Um, it was an oral tradition, and again, it was not based on science. In the 1990s, uh, a series of experiments were conducted that exposed some of these so-called truths as myths. And so scientists today, fire scientists today, um, believe that thousands of fires have been misinterpreted um, um, because of reliance on these myths. And uh, as one expert told me re recently, you know, God knows how many innocent people have been convicted. Uh, because of the reliance on these myths. Um, so before I talk about Christine's case, I would like to just talk to you about some of these myths. Um, the biggest myth out there is that a fire started with an accelerant burns hotter and faster than a non-accelerated fire. Absolutely not true. We know this is not true because of experiments and peer-reviewed studies. Another common myth that arson investigators rely on is that a fire started with an accelerant will leave a burn pattern on the floor. It looks like a pour pattern. You can actually see it after you extinguish the fire and you hose down the floor. You see these burn patterns on the floor, and that means an accelerant was used right there where you see the burn pattern. Uh, well, that might be true, but what we have learned through science and experiments is that non-accelerated fires show these same burn patterns. And so it's not necessarily an indicator of arson. Another common myth 
If you go into a house or uh, a building and you find melted aluminum, oh, that's an example. It had to have been an accelerated fire. Again, we now know that non-accelerated fires also shows melted aluminum on the floor. So this is not an indicator of arson. And the list goes on. Um, another example is uh, spalling of concrete. Spalling of concrete means that after you extinguish a fire and you go to look at the concrete, if it chips or falls away, that's called spalling. It was, or is, even today, routinely thought that when you have spalling of concrete, this is evidence of arson. Again, we now know that we see this in non-accelerated fires as well. So this is not necessarily an indicator of arson. So what we have is we have fire investigators um, that have chosen to do something that it turns out is a lot more complicated than they ever signed up for. And um, many of the old timers, the people who taught the fire investigators this oral tradition, um, they are not keeping up with developments in the field and are clinging on to these old beliefs. And so the problem remains today, unfortunately, because you have tons of holdouts. Um, and, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, these good old boys have investigated 5,000 fires in their lifetime, and by golly, they're just not going to change the way they're going to do things. And we have no uniform set of regulations out there at this point to guide fire investigators. We've started to do this with certain publications, but it's just taking a long time um, to get the word out. And um, one of the uh, experts in Christine's case is a retired um, special agent with the uh, uh, ATF, um, he routinely goes to these conferences and tries to educate fire investigators um, with regards to this new science, and he said it is an uphill battle. He said many of these fire investigators did not take chemistry and physics in high school. They never, got, uh, they never graduated from college. They come to these conferences and they're out on the golf course instead of, you know, in the seminar room learning about these new developments. And so it's very, very frustrating for um, th those who um, now think it's very important to, to, to educate uh, arson investigators um, by what we now know to be true. Um, no, I just have to mention <laughs> how primitive, again, um, you know, some of the arson investigators, um, the techniques are um, that arson investigators would use, but sometimes an arson investigator thought that they could go into a structure and they could actually determine whether gasoline had been used to set a fire by tasting residue in the structure. And then they were told to eat white bread in between tastes of the residue, and then they would make a determination as to whether gasoline was used. Um, so before I talk about Christine's case in detail, um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what Christine's life was like at the time um, that this tragedy unfolded. It was 1995. Christine was 21 years of age. Her son, Tony, was three years of age. She and her son lived in her mother's trailer in a small town uh, south of Indianapolis, probably about 60, 70 miles south of Indianapolis, Greensburg, Indiana. Um, her mother, Christine's mother, was not living in the trailer at the time. She was recently divorced and had a job in Columbus. And so uh, Christine and Tony had the trailer to themselves. Um, this was a time Christine was working low-wage jobs uh, through a temp, temp agency. Um, she had recently signed up for classes to receive training as a machinist. And um, she thought that she could get a job. If she had this training, she could get a job in a factory that was going to be opening up in Greensburg and that this would allow her to, um, to, to get a higher pay. Um, so the day before the fire on June 29th, she and Tony woke up at about 6 in the morning. She, uh, they had breakfast. At about 7 o'clock, they walked over to her neighbor's trailer, a man by the name of Tom Claxton. He was in his 60s. He was retired. And he would babysit for Tony when Christine was working or when Christine was going to school. And Christine, Tony, and Tom Claxton all had a wonderful relationship. But she drops Tony off at his house to babysit. She goes to her class. She comes home. She mows Tom La Claxton's yard um, 
uh, Tony followed her with his toy mower that day. She goes back to her trailer. Uh, she fixes dinner. She does laundry. Um, she bathes herself. She bathes Tony. Uh, they settle down in the living room of the trailer. That was where the air conditioner was, and it was very hot in southern Indiana at the time. Uh, she reads to Tony and sings him to sleep, and they both fall asleep on the sofa of the, uh, in the living room of the trailer. And then the nightmare began. Um, the next morning, on June 30th, 1995, Christina woke to smoke and flames uh, in her mother's trailer. Tony was no longer with her on uh, the sofa. Uh, she runs to go find him, and she finds him in a bedroom. But she can't get to him because of the flames, because of the smoke, and because of the heat. She cannot get to him. She sees him on the bed. She tries, she takes a blanket, she tries to put out the fire, she's unsuccessful. She grabs a pillow, tries to uh, put out the fire, she's not able to. She runs to the kitchen to get the fire extinguisher, but can't find it because of the smoke. She runs out of the trailer, she yells for Tom Claxton that there's a fire, she needs his help. He comes out, they find a tricycle, they go to the, um, the bedroom where Christine saw Tony, and they take the tricycle and they break out the window of the bedroom. And at that point, all the oxygen comes into the room and the whole room goes up into flames. Um, by this time, the police and the um, firefighters had been called. They arrive immediately on the scene. A firefighter goes in to rescue Tony, um, but is not able to save uh, Tony's life. Um, the firefighter um, would later testify that he remembered when he was crawling through the debris to get to Tony in the bedroom, he came across some sort of obstruction. He didn't know what it was, but it was something that was blocking his ability to get into the bedroom. Um, Tony was uh, immediately declared dead. Um, he, the cause of death, and this becomes very important later in her case, was not thermal injuries because of the fire. He died of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. His carboxyhemoglobin level was 80% um, at the time they did the autopsy. Um, Christine is only wearing a nightgown at that time. Um, they immediately take her to the hospital. She's also suffering from uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and she has, she's suffering minor injuries uh, from the fire. Um, she is medicated when she's at the hospital, but the police come and talk to her immediately, and they take a statement. And they came back a few hours later, and they took another statement. Uh, again, she was medicated at the time. And then finally, probably about a week later, they took a third statement from her. Um, she always said in these statements that she did not set the fire and um, that she did not, uh, they believed that she had set the fire, and she claimed that, you know, she did not. Um, the firefighters, interestingly enough, concluded within two hours of having arrived at the scene that this was an arson. And um, a week after this occurred, Christine Bunch was arrested for the arson murder um, of her three-year-old son. Uh, in 1996, a year later, she was tried before a jury. The prosecutor told the jury in opening statement that he would not present a motive for this crime. Um, and he said, I don't have to present a motive in order to present to uh, prove murder. But what I will tell you is that Christine Bunch started this fire in two different rooms. She started the fire in the living room, and she started the fire in the uh, bedroom. And we have uh, two origins of fire, and that's indicative of arson. Um, the fire investigators then testified that it was their opinion the fire was arson because, you know what, they found burn patterns on the floor. We know that means arson. We found melted aluminum on the floor. We know that means arson. Um, but the most compelling evidence um, for the prosecution came from an ATF agent from Washington, D.C., who was a chemist. And his, his name was William Kennard. And he testified that uh, he analyzed nine samples from the floor of the trailer. Some of these samples came from the bedroom, and some of these samples came from the living room. 
and he claimed of the nine samples from the floor, five tested positive for an accelerant. And he said, I can't tell you what the accelerant is, but I can tell you it's a heavy petroleum distillate. And he also said most of these uh, positive samples came from the living room, but one came from the bedroom. Um, although he could not say what the heavy petroleum distillate was, he said this includes a group of uh, chemicals such as diesel oil, uh, uh, jet fuel oil, and kerosene. Um, the ATF's testimony at trial allowed the prosecution to argue that the fire had two origins, one in the living room and one in the bedroom. Um, the prosecution then presented evidence from the firefighter who uh, went to rescue Tony that he uh, ran into an obstruction um, on his way. And so they argued that Christine had blocked the door of the bedroom with a chair. Um, the trial lasted six days. Christine did not testify. Rather, she sat quietly at defense counsel uh, table, taking instructions from her attorney, don't show too much emotion. Remain rigid. You know, you don't, you, you, you know, it's important that you not react to this evidence. The jury deliberated for just a few hours. They returned a, a verdict of guilty. The prosecution then argued that Christine should be sentenced to mandatory natural life without the possibility of parole. The judge eventually sentenced her to 60 years in prison. That happened in 1996. Fast forward to the year 2006. I was actively investigating arson cases at the center. I had recently read many articles that were talking about how these arson myths were being dispelled by science, and I was extremely interested in this issue. Um, and I had recently gone to breakfast with um, one of the most famous fire scientists in the country. His name is uh, Dr. John DeHaan. And uh, he's considered the guru of uh, fire science. He's written all the textbooks on fire science. And he's a prosecution guy. He always testifies for the prosecution. And I had breakfast with him, and he was quite alarmed by the new science that was coming out. And he, you know, he was part of this, this, this new group of people that thought it was very important to dispel the myths and to start educating arson investigators about the myths. Um, so I, I had met him. Um, and then at about the same time, we received an envelope in the mail at the Center on Wrongful Convictions. And in this envelope was a chapter from a book uh, written by a woman who had uh, recounted Christine's case and suggested in this article that Christine uh, perhaps had been wrongfully convicted and was maybe innocent. And um, there was a law student, a summer law student at the time, who kept on bugging me about this. And he said, you need, we need to look at Christine's case. And I remember saying, ah, I'm looking at some other cases. I don't know if we have time. And he said, we need to look at this case. And I said, well, get me some records. You know, see if you can contact your family. Uh, have them send the trial transcript. I'd like to look at the, the transcript. And, um, and then I will consult with some experts, and we'll see where it takes us. And um, so that happened. Uh, we eventually did receive the trial transcript um, from Christine's trial. And um, I, I read it. And um, I was struck by many things. Um, the first thing, and, and we collected a lot of other records um, about Christine. Um, again, one thing that we do at the Center on Wrongful Convictions, we're a very small operation. Um, we don't have very many attorneys. We receive sometimes 200 letters a month from all over the world asking for our representation. We can only take a handful of cases, and so we have to vet them carefully. And actually, I think this is what we're best at, is vetting the cases. I think that one of the reasons we've been so successful is that we pick the right cases. But that requires, um, that requires time. Um, so I read Christine's uh, transcript and the other information we'd collected about her, and um, I was struck by the fact that she had no prior record at all. The only thing she had was a speeding ticket for driving five miles per hour over the speed limit. That was it. Um, as Judy mentioned earlier, um, Christine Bunch had no history of mental illness. There was no history of psychological or psychiatric counseling at any time in her life. And so, you know, I always have a gut reaction with these cases where women are accused of, of, of murdering their, their, their children that, you know, that's, you know, those of us who are mothers, you, you know, we protect our, we protect our children. And, um, again, unless there is some 
evidence of, of a severe uh, mental illness, um, you know, I think that that is um, a, a truth. Um, also, we found out from talking to people in Greensburg, Christine Bunch was a loving mother. Um, no one ever saw any evidence of abuse, and that they had a wonderful relationship. Um, Christine Bunch never confessed. There was no eyewitness who ever said that she set the fire. There was no witness that could testify that she um, had ever talked about setting fire to the trailer. There was no motive. The trailer was not insured. Um, there was no evidence um, that before the fire, she was seen buying accelerant. Um, her nightgown was tested, and there was no evidence of accelerant on the nightgown. Um, and I knew that the testimony about the, the burn patterns and the melted aluminum, um, the so-called arson indicators, I knew that that was something that we could debunk because I knew that that was not true, that that was necessarily an indicator of arson. So the next thing that I did was that I consulted with John DeHaan. And I called him up and I said, I really want to know what you think about this case. And I don't want you to tell me what you think about this case as a defense paid expert. I'm not paying you yet. I want to consult with you. I want to know what you really think. And he thought it was a possible wrongful conviction. Um, and he was very, very concerned about the, um, the fact that the fire investigators had talked about the so-called indicators of arson, which we now know are, are not indicators. But he was concerned about the ATF agents finding that there were floor samples that tested positive for heavy petroleum distillate. And so he said, what I really want to see is the, the, the data behind that finding. I need to see the file of the ATF agent. And the only thing we had was the testimony of the ATF agent and a very, very simple um, report that was two pages long, which just set out the conclusion that these sa samples tested positive for heavy petroleum distillate. I can't tell you exactly what the chemical is, but it could be kerosene, it could be you know, diesel fuel, and it could be jet oil. Um, um, and it's something else that I found out uh, when I was investigating the case is that um, the trailer in which Christine and Tony lived for years had been heated by a kerosene heater that sat in the living room, right exactly where they found evidence of uh, heavy petroleum distillate. There was a kerosene heater. And then I interviewed prior owners of this trailer, and they talked about how they had spilled kerosene on occasion on the floor, because in the wintertime, they would not take the heater out to fill it. They would bring the kerosene in, and that they had had some big spills. At one time, a gallon of kerosene had spilled all over the, um, the floor. And so I thought, oh, this is interesting. This would be an innocent explanation for why you would find heavy petroleum distillate um, you know, on the floor if, if it were, in fact, kerosene. But it wouldn't explain the heavy petroleum distillate in the bedroom. Um, so anyway, John DeHaan said, we need to get that report. At the same time, Christine Bunch was telling me, <laughs> we need to subpoena the ATF report and uh, the ATF file. And this was something that every time I talked to her after we agreed to take the case, she mentioned, we need to get that ATF file. And I, to this day, I, you know, I find that fascinating because we eventually, you know, as luck would have it, Washington, D.C. had the file. It was a huge file. They sent it to me, and it turned out to be a treasure trove of information. And I have to say that the day that I started looking through this file, I was stunned, and I was dumbstruck. First thing I find out is that the data showed that the heavy petroleum distillate was, in fact, kerosene. You know, the expert testified he didn't know what the chemical was. The data and the chromatograph showed it was kerosene. I thought, well, we have an explanation for why there would be kerosene in the living room. And then the next thing that happened that I saw, again, it, it, you know, it was, I've never encountered anything like this in, you know, close to 34 years of, of practice. Um, I found an initial report by that chemist who determined that there was no he heavy petroleum distillate that had been found in the bedroom. He said, no, it had not been found in the bedroom. And then there was another report that showed that that had been altered after a conversation with the local authorities in Indiana. And then there was the final report that showed no alteration, but the final conclusion that heavy petroleum distillate had been found in the bedroom. And so I thought, oh my goodness, this is a report that had been changed. 
The initial report showed no heavy petroleum distillate or anything in the bedroom. So I sent the file to John DeHaan to look at, but I didn't show him at first these altered reports. I just showed him the raw data. And he came back, he called me, and he said, I'm looking at the raw data, and the raw data says there's no heavy petroleum distillate in the bedroom. And I said, well, let me show you these altered reports, and then you tell me what you think of the ATF. And John DeHaan was very, very, you know, close to the ATF. He, he trained ATF agents. He had worked for ATF. And so he was sort of, you know, in a, a, this situation, I mean, his mouth dropped open um, when, 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 when he saw the file. So um, at this point, um, I thought we have all of the evidence we need to debunk the state's um, you know, the state's uh, uh, evidence at trial. We were also able to show, and this was very simple, that there was no chair that was blocking the entrance to the bedroom. And we were able to do that just by looking at the photographs because there was a chair that was near the bedroom door but not blocking the bedroom door. And you could see where it was because it was the, the, the area underneath the chair was protected from the fire, and so you could see exactly where the chair had been, and it was not in front of the door. And so a simple photograph at trial would have, um, you know, disabused the jury of that argument. Um, so um, we put together a case. Um, we also were able to, at the same time, because we were working with many different experts from all over the country, we were also able to develop evidence uh, affirmatively showing that this fire was accidental. And this um, had to do with the fact that uh, uh, little Tony died of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. And um, what our experts were telling us and what we were learning through um, uh, immersing ourselves in forensic toxicology is that um, if the fire had been set in the bedroom, on the floor, Tony would have died of thermal injuries long before he ever could have um, died of this carbon monoxide poisoning, which was 80% in his body. Um, the, um, if the fire had started in the bedroom floor, it would have taken 90 minutes um, or more for his carboxyhemoglobin uh, level to reach 80%. Um, this fire was only a 30-minute fire. And so um, our experts believe that what happened is that there was a slow smoldering fire in between the ceiling and the roof of the trailer in the bedroom floor, and that uh, carbon monoxide was uh, seeping through the ceiling, you know, throughout the night, which explained why Christine was suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning as well as, as, as Tony. And... Um, Again, it, it was, um, th there were electrical problems um, in the trailer, um, in the ceiling area, and so we believed that that was, um, you know, that's how the fire uh, happened. So we also had affirmative evidence to show that um, Christine Bunch um, uh, had not set this fire and that this fire was accidental. So um, we presented our evidence um, uh, at a hearing, um, and uh, after my colleague Karen Daniel and I, we, we, we wrote a post-conviction petition um, that we filed in the, in the circuit court. We automatically were entitled to a hearing. Um, at that time, we decided to bring in um, uh, uh, the managing partner of Schiff, Harden, and Waite, um, a, a, a man by the name of um, Ron Safer. Um, before he went into private practice, he was chief of the criminal division at the U.S. Attorney's Office and prosecuted arson cases. And so I took this case to him, and he said, boy, I know an arson case when I see it, and this is not an arson case. And so he became part of our team, and we wanted him to present the, uh, the, the actual testimony of all of these experts we had been working with um, for the past year. And so he conducted the hearing. And um, we presented what we thought was a, a very good case the whole time. And we presented this in front of the same judge who had heard the original trial, who had a reputation, frankly, as a hanging judge. And so while we thought we had a great case, we were very, very careful to tell Christine every step of the way is that we were not sure we could we could ever win in Indiana, that it might take years before we could get to federal court to convince somebody that she's entitled to a new trial. Well, lo and behold, we presented our evidence, and we thought 
we thought things went very well for us, but we lost. We lost big time. And um, so we were devastated, but not surprised. We immediately appealed. Um, two and a half years later, the appellate court in Indiana reversed her case and uh, said that she was entitled to a new trial. And um, again, this was wonderful news for Christine, but again, I, I had to be the bearer of bad news. And I said, Christine, nobody's going to release you right away because the state's going to try to appeal this to the Indiana Supreme Court. And if the Indiana Supreme Court decides to take this case, we're talking about years more um, of, of being in prison. So Christine sat um, for another nine months or so. Eventually, the, state, uh, the Indiana State Supreme Court decided not to take the case. And um, uh, we were able to get Christine released on bond. And then the prosecution in uh, December of 2012 um, dismissed uh, the charges against her. Um, and so what we were left with at the end of the day was that Christine got out of this fire and Tony did not. And that's, you know, that, that was sort of the gut feeling of the prosecution. This is why she must be guilty of arson murder, because she got out and he did not. And um, there is sort of this favorite saying, it's actually sort of a sick saying um, uh, among arson investigators, um, but they, they joke that if there's a fire in a home, you better hope that everyone survives or everyone dies, because if that's not the case, there's going to be a prosecution for arson. You can bet on it. So um, with that, Christine, take it over. <laughs> Going through a wrongful conviction, prosecution, investigation, after such a devastating loss, I mean, you're beaten down and broken so badly that um, things kind of pass by without you even realizing oh, hey, I'm a suspect, or they're getting ready to convict me. I mean, it all just kind of passes in a haze. And I see now how so many people who are in that position are able to confess to things they didn't do, say whatever, just to make it stop. Because coming to you at that moment and tearing you down more and trying to make you say things that they want you to say, you just want it to stop. You just want them to leave you alone. And I'm, I'm very, I guess, happy that they weren't able to break me. But um, now looking back on it, it would have been very easy. It was a very hard time. I was on trial. I was six months pregnant and going to prison for 60 years. And of course, you get there and you think, oh, my direct appeal, that's, that's going to come through and I'm going to get out. They're going to see. I'm innocent. Somebody's going to see. Those appeals don't always come through the way you want. And so everyone told me, you need to, you need to look ahead. That's not going to happen for you. They don't win. So I was like, okay, well, it came in and they had vacated my arson conviction. So I thought, oh, that means something. There's no arson conviction. There absolutely can't be a murder. Well, no, that's not true. They just reworded my murder charge to include arson. And then they could say it wasn't double jeopardy charging me with both. So, I mean, those first years in prison, I was blessed. I mean, my family took my son and I got to see Trent all the time. And I was in a fairly decent facility. We had a women, a woman superintendent, and she encouraged me. I mean, she listened to me when I got there and said, I'm innocent. I shouldn't be here. And she patted me on the head and said, everyone says that. But as I kept saying it, she started encouraging me. I wrote to everyone hundreds and hundreds of letters of course, with a murder case, most private attorneys want twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars to start looking at your case. It's a big deal, and there was no way I could ask my family to put up more. I initially wrote the Center on Wrongful Convictions and received a very nice letter back telling me that they did not have the staff or the funds to take on a case like mine. And so I just kept pushing forward. 
any opportunity they gave me in there, I took it. I worked a couple jobs. I took classes. I got my degrees in there through Ball State. And the superintendent kept encouraging me. And she said, you know, she said, if you're really innocent, she said, why don't you go do research in the law library? And so I started spending all my time in the law library, got a paralegal certificate, started helping other ladies through there, and I started reading about arson cases. As things came to my attention, like the arson myths article that came out, I realized I've got all those in my case. All those. I check, could sit and check them off for my transcripts. And I was like, this is going to mean something. This is going to mean something. So I kept writing, kept writing, and one of the ladies in there introduced me to an author who said, you know, I'll, I'll put your, your story in my book, but I'm not going to guarantee what I'm going to say about it. I'm going to investigate. And she said, if you're really, truly innocent, then I'll say that. So it was clear up until the day that book come out before I knew that she believed in me. And she had put it in there that um, she believed it was a miscarriage of justice. So that gave me hope and spurred me forward a little bit more. And I continued to write and ask people if they would help. And finally, one of the ladies that I was in there with introduced me to her attorney. And she was a local gal, Hillary Bricks. And she agreed to take my case for two thousand dollar retainer fee and I was making thirty dollars a month payments out of my state pay and Hillary went through everything and she come in and told me she said I know you're innocent but we don't have anything to to go on she said we need investigators she said we need money she said we need help and I said well I don't I don't know where we're gonna get that I mean I'm trying to do paperwork in here, research. I'm Every week I'm sending her letters. Have you looked at this? And can we get this? And what about this? And I just read this. And finally she had sent me in an article about a couple investigators. And so I, I called her and I was like, we need to call them. They're going to help us. One of them, they're going to help. And she said, they're like two of the best. Do you know how much that's going to cost? And I was like, we, we need to push forward. We need this help. So she called the first one, and he told her $300 an hour. And so she didn't bother to call the second one. Well, the next week, I'm calling, saying, did you call the second one? And she said, I haven't. And I said, call. Call. Tell them our situation. They're going to help. And so he agreed to give us 10 hours pro bono. And that was actually um, turned out to be the forensic toxicologist who looked at my son's autopsy report and proved that it wasn't an arson based on his carbon monoxide level. So I thought, hey, that's all you need, right? It's going to open the door. It absolutely doesn't work like that. Um, Northwestern contacted me during that time and asked for my transcripts. We got the transcripts to him and um, I had my first interview with Jane Riley and Karen Daniel. And the whole way over there, you're trying not to cry. and You're just praying and hoping that they're going to see it and they're going to take you on. And I think it took another five weeks after I met them before I got the official word that they were taking my case. And at that moment, I mean, you think, hey, I've got some big help. I got big guns now, you know. We're going to walk out the door, and it just doesn't work like that. You think you're getting ahead, you file a motion, and <laughs> they continue it. <laughs> and you think, oh, hey, we're going to get into court, and they push it off. Every chance I thought that we won, they denied it. <laughs> and then you had the appeals process to go through. And in the meantime, they stick it to you more because we were at um, the, deci the decision process for my PCR. And Jane came to see me to tell me that my prosecutor had said if we, if we drop everything, he'd agree to a plea agreement, which 
would give me an out date that I could see. And I remember Jane telling me, it's okay. She said, we all understand you have a child out there and you want to get out to him. And she said, we're going to support you no matter what. I mean, she was crisp and just laid it out. And she said, it's just up to you. And I was like, but what would you do? And she said, I can't. I can't tell you that. And she said, I just have to lay it out to you. That's my responsibility. And I'm going to honor whatever you want. And I just looked at her and I just cried. Because that's absolutely what I wanted. I wanted out more than anything in the world. But I just couldn't. I just couldn't. He had left me there for so long. And now I had all these people that believed in me and knew the truth. I just couldn't not to get what I wanted. I couldn't. So we pushed forward, and it was a long fight. But um, I'm still just in awe of my team. I truly had a dream team. I was so blessed to have people step up, fight for me, believe in me, support me, listen to me when I said get the ATF file, when I'm just, you know, (laughs) a girl in prison talking about, I think this is important. And not knowing that it really was. I mean, right now, the big thing needs to be getting focus out there, making people more aware, getting more people to step up and volunteer, because I know there are other people out there that are innocent. I know we haven't reached out to all of them, and I know that most of them don't know who to reach out to. So opportunities like this give us a chance to educate let people know how important it is to to share our stories with others and hopefully get more people involved, have more people helped, more people saved. So I thank you. Can I talk a little bit about what you're doing now? Can I, can I ask you about that? Yes. Hi. I said, you know, I just thought since since we're here and and. I th- isn't Christine amazing and Jane too? I mean, I'm in awe. But seriously, but I thought you 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 all might enjoy hearing a little bit about um, what Christine what Christine's life has been like since since she got out, how she's rebuilding her life. Um, when I got out, I had this pretty little picture that I was gonna live with my 16 year old son, and we were gonna have a happy little family. Of course, um, that doesn't always work out like that. I walked out to um, a very angry 16-year-old who was on probation and doing whatever and about to get kicked out of school. So that whole first year, I did nothing but just focus on him and work on him and get him off probation and get him off all the meds he was on because they said he had ADHD and ODD and MDD and every kind of DD you'd ever heard of and pretty much any time he got into trouble well he got another medication so we went to counseling he was in um, a rehab program I went to counseling there twice a week and um, we slowly started building him up and connecting In the end, he chose to go back and live with my mom. I understand that. She was his mom for 16 years. I mean, I can't fault him for that, and I understand that he feels pulled, and like if he wants to be with me, that that's gonna hurt my mom. And so that dream kind of fizzled, and I realized, you know, I needed to stop acting like I could get back those years, because it's never going to happen. They're just gone. And so now I just need to concentrate on being his mom slash friend and getting to know who he is now and hopefully having a relationship as we go. I um, took the LSAT before I left prison, and... um, I had already decided that I was going to go to law school. I felt like 
there was a lot of people out there that needed somebody to listen. Who better than somebody <laughs> who had been in that situation and had people that didn't listen to me. So um, I started coming to Chicago a lot, and I would go speak at <laughs> the center. And I connected with the first women in Innocence Conference, and I got to meet some of the other women. And those were the people that I was comfortable with. Those were the people that knew that I was in culture shock and didn't know how to use my cell phone and couldn't pump gas and had never opened a checking account and didn't understand why people weren't carrying cash anymore. So, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was great to have people that understood, but the perfect thing about coming to Chicago was that nobody knew me. I walked all over Michigan Ave, and I was in all those stores, and never once did I hear somebody whisper, there's that girl. That's her. Didn't you see it on the news? And I loved it. I was like, this is, this is my safe place. This is where I want to be. So I decided, because I was going to push straight into law school, that I needed time just to kind of get used to being me, get used to being on my own. And um, in October, I up and moved on my 40th birthday to Evanston. And um, I was supposed to, at that time, I was working for Speedway as management, and my job was supposed to transfer. Instead, I got here and discovered they had transferred somebody else into my job. So I started working through Northwestern's temporary department, and I got a few jobs. Um, I was hired through um, Rivers Casino, and I worked as a security guard there. And actually, that finishes up this week. I just got a new job with Northwestern University. I'm going to be an administrative assistant to the chaplain there in Evanston. So I'm excited about that. But, um, I mean, it's one day at a time. Some days are really, really good. And I feel like, hey, I'm moving forward. And the next day, I get really frustrated, and I get stu stuck in traffic, and people honk the horn at me a lot, and I come home, and I just cry, because <laughs> it was just a rough day. But, um, of course, I'm still planning on going to law school. I just know I don't have to do it right now. I still have plenty of time and can move forward. The rest of my time, I spend going and speaking and hopefully educating people and making them more aware of the projects we have going and how they can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, she asked why, why the women question for a long period of time don't ask for an attorney. Well, um, I'd like to answer that in, in um, two parts. One part is um, there are, um, I know that you watch TV and movies, but um, the reality of the situation is there's a program where there are volunteer attorneys who get a call when someone is arrested and they go racing to whatever the Chicago police station is to try to, you know, offer some counsel or whatever because, um, with, and, what they have to, and what they have told us anyways is that, um, they they um, question the person, and um, and then only then after they've talked to the person or gotten a statement, or then a phone call is allowed. It's not like in the movies where you arrive and you're immediately given a phone. And the other thing I wanted to say was about asking for um, an attorney. Is in these, in a lot of the cases that we're that you know we were talking about where people are are innocent, um, and especially if it's a situation where it's your child you want to help them solve the crime or solve the mystery of what happened. So you're, you, would, you would cooperate, you would go, and you would talk to them and talk to them and try to be helpful. And you, would, and, you, know, you wouldn't even think that you needed an attorney. Why would you need an attorney? You're, you know, you're obviously innocent. You're a nice person. Um, we haven't we haven't done any um, particular studies of that, but I will just 
you know, I'll tell you, if, if, if someone is ever interested in looking a little bit more at statistics, um, there, although they, although this doesn't have every factor, but there's something called the, um, the National Registry of Exonerations. And it's, it's accessible to anybody through their, you know, through the internet. It's a joint project through this Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern Law School and the University of Michigan. And it lists in alphabetical order every single person who has been exonerated after being wrongfully convicted, every person that they has come to their attention in any event. And then they have, they break it down into, into certain factors. So if you're interested, um, and, and if you're interested in looking at, at like women, you can you can sort and look at women's cases or by state or things like that. So I I mean I have not personally, you know, studied that you know that issue in all of the cases, but I will tell you, um, I do you know I do not know a single wealthy person who has been, I mean in my experience who's been convicted of a of a serious crime. And obviously, um, that's one of the things that's one of the big disparities in our criminal justice system is that people with a lot of money have a tendency to have a lot more resource, resources, including, you know, better, um, you know, better uh, legal help. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that necessarily every single case that we've looked at, the person is, is poor, but obviously, the, you know, the great, the great majority are. But the interesting thing about um, the women's cases, and I, I can't speak to, you know, I haven't met and talked to or interviewed or seen the, the data on every single exonerated woman in America. But um, let me go back here to this. Oops. I'm going to go back, try to go back. I want to go back to the other, the original. Can you go back? Can we go back to the original? Okay. Well, anyways, I'm just going to show you. Okay, this, this is not all of the women, but I wanted to show you that photo, whoops. Okay, I'll go back to the bigger one. Well, anyways, if you can go, at some point get back to that, oh yeah, that photo shows, okay. It's interesting, These, this, this photo was taken at the launch event for the Women's Project at the Center on Wrongful Convictions, and we had um, a conference um, last month where we had you know more women than this, but um, I mean, but it's interesting if you look at these women. There's, I mean, there's there's one minority woman, and and it was it's interesting because the, the particular night when these women came, we had the male exonerees came, you know, were were called up also, and my and my husband was there, and he is he's not, you know, I mean, he hears a lot about these cases from like me, but he's not a, a you know a scholar in the area, and he was just like, oh, it's so interesting that that like the men exonerees are all minorities and like and, and the women are all like white middle class. <laughs> and I mean that, you know, I, I don't know what the, um, it, it, but I think it just goes to show that especially in these, these situations where there is um, no crime has been committed or something like that, that can, that can happen to anybody. It could happen to anybody. Obviously, if you are wealthy or middle class, you have a better shot at having um, a good attorney who will have good experts, but still, I mean, it can it can happen to anybody. I mean, if you look if you look at those women, would you if you saw those women coming down the street, would you think, oh, that she looks like she was in prison? No, you know, no, not. <laughs> I mean, not not at not at all. Christine Bunch's attorney was uh, um, the, the the small community. Um, where she came from, did not have a public defender's office. So they had to, and she couldn't afford counsel, so they had to appoint uh, a local defense attorney to represent her, and uh, he had never uh, defended a murder case before. And uh, to this day, I am absolutely um, stunned that he did not have Christine take the stand to testify on her own behalf. This is somebody who had no prior record, had, you know, had things to celebrate and had a story to tell, and yet, um, you, know, the, the, you know, a decision was made uh, through advice of counsel that she not take the stand. So, um. Well, I mean, we had, we had another um, case where we had a, a trial of, a, um, of an innocent woman who had been convict, wrongfully convicted of, of murdering her, her child, 
And in that case, in, at her first trial, which, in which she was convicted, her second trial, she was acquitted. But in her first trial, um, she was so emotionally upset because, you know, imagine going through a trial, you know, it was upsetting, of course, to anybody, but also a trial where you're seeing evidence of your child's death. And they're talking about your child. They're talking about you. And maybe people are saying, maybe your neighbors are saying things about you, like, you know, or about, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're just so many different ways you're upset. But this woman was so, com was so completely devastated that, that basically she was drugged kind of during her trial because she just couldn't, could, couldn't tolerate barely sitting through it. And so then they're looking at her and saying, oh, you know, look at how, She's not showing any emotion, how suspicious, like Christine was saying. But I, you know, these women's cases that we've looked at, it's like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. They'll, they'll be like, oh, she didn't show enough grief right afterwards. Oh, she showed too much grief. It seemed fake. I mean, no matter what, this demeanor testimony, it just seems like, you know, I, I tell people, be nice to your neighbors, because we have these cases where these neighbors come out, <laughs> these neighbors come out of the woodwork, and they just talk about how, sus how suspicious you were acting. <laughs> Well, um, I don't know of any data. Do you know, Jane? No. Uh, surprisingly, though, m many of our exonerated clients do testify at trial. And if they don't testify at trial, they testify um, in allocution at their sentencing hearing and make very eloquent statements about how one day, you know, you're going to learn that this is a, a huge mistake. And I especially see this a lot in um, our cases where um, um, there was a prosecution uh, for the death penalty. And, um, uh, but anyway, I have, I have no statistics. Again, we'd have to look at the National Registry of Exonerations in order to pull that together. But that's a very interesting point, and uh, I think that that's something that we should do. Yeah, uh, well, you know, a lot, and a lot of exonerees, um, attorneys, it, um, strongly advise them not to testify, and they generally, you know, they generally take their, their attorney's advice, so. Um, it's, yeah, that, that, is an interest, that is an interesting question. Well, there's, I mean, we have people who have volunteered in, um, you know, in, in, in different capacities. I'll tell you one, one area that I think might be an interesting way to have volunteers is, um, when people, when an innocent person is released from prison, their first year out is, is so challenging. You know, they have no um, work history. They have no, you know, credit history. They have, you know, they, there's um, a lot of people who still kind of wonder about them because they were in prison. Um, the thing about it, if somebody is in prison and they actually did the crime and then they're, they're um, released on parole, there's various programs that are in place to help them, you know, go out into society. But the thing about exonerations is they're frequently, like some unusual date that just happens to come up when the state decides to dismiss charges or whatever. And it's not necessarily something that we um, anticipate. And so that person can be, can find out like one morning that they're being released at night, and if nobody comes and gets them, they're going to be put on a, a bus and sent to Chicago. And they may or may not have family members who are around, who are still alive after many years in prison, who are willing to take, willing to take them in. So an interesting way to volunteer might be to think about if there are, um, you know, people who might know of um, job possibilities, places that might hire somebody um, who's been exonerated, or people who might have apartments, people who might be willing to do things like mentor an exoneree or give an exoneree, 
computer classes or, you know, or, or you know, show them around, you know, th these types of things. I mean, I'm just imagining that something like that, if people were interested in, or in a sort of organizing that type of thing and being available, that's an interesting um, possibility for, you know, for volunteer work. Because they get out of prison and they have, they have no money. And, you know, you read about maybe they get compensation from the state or maybe they get a lawsuit. Well, these are both, neither of these are guaranteed and neither of them are going to happen the first year. So they've got that first year to live through. So that's just a possibility. Oh. I didn't recognize any of that hat. Hi. Hey, Benny. <laughs> Yes, a month ago I filed civil suits, a state action, and a federal action. Of course, that takes years, and Indiana does not have a certificate of innocence like Illinois does. So I've been working and making it on my own, and thank goodness I found somebody who was willing to give me a lease to an apartment without credit history. I've had people step up and help me and take me places. I mean, when you get out, it's scary. I mean, you don't know what to expect. Everything's changed. My first day out, my brother took me to a movie. It took me about 15 minutes in the bathroom because I couldn't figure out how to turn on the water. And then finally, I just managed to get under there, and it came on, and I was like, oh, okay. So, I mean, those kind of things, it's it's really hard to figure out, especially after you've been gone for such a long amount of time. And so I'm thankful that I've had people step up and say, hey, do you want to go to a movie? Do you want to go check out this restaurant? Or there's this lovely garden? Or do you want to go get coffee and go walk on the beach? It's little things like that that don't really take a whole lot, and it means the world to us. just helps us get out there, build a little more confidence. Yeah, no, yes, there are, there are innocence projects um, in, you know, around the country, there's many of them around the countries. Um, we are, there's the, um, the biggest one in the country is the Innocence Project in New York, and the Center on Wrongful Convictions is the second biggest. But there are, there are a lot of other um, innocence projects. There's other ones in Illinois, there's other ones in other states. Um, some of the projects are affiliated with law schools. Um, some have a loose affiliation with a law school, and some are not affiliated with law school, uh, law school at all. And what's wonderful about the Northwestern Project is that we are supported by the university. And although we have a very, very small staff, um, the greatest resource the university gives us are students who can help us investigate the case, help us draft pleadings, help us do research, and we use our third-year law students uh, to actually present uh, testimony in court. And uh, so that's the, the wonderful benefit of being associated with a law school. Well, Indiana, I guess, is a bit different than Illinois. Um, when I first got there, I went through cosmetology school, was able to get my cosmetology license. Um, from there, I enrolled in Ball State, and I got an associate's and bachelor's degree. Uh, paralegal certificate, I was able to do that by correspondence and work in our law library. I was part of the clown ministry. I got another associate's degree in theology through the Episcopal Church. Um, I trained dogs for a non-for-profit program for handicapped <laughs> children. And um, the great thing about that was when it was time to pair the, the dog with the child, we actually had the kids come in with their families and we got to teach them how to use their dog and then have a graduation ceremony where they got to take their their dog home and then we got updates on them so I mean there was a lot the greatest thing for me was six months after I had my son 
they opened up a family preservation program. So he was allowed to actually come inside the facility and have one-on-one -on -one time with me. And it wasn't, it wasn't a prison area. I mean, we crawled on the floor together and we had a jungle gym to play on. And they were pretty innovative and there was a lot you could do. And if, if Christine had been incarcerated in, in Illinois, she would not have been able to take college classes. Illinois is, is absolutely regressive in, in this respect, and there is just this belief that if you are sentenced to hard time, you do hard time, and taxpayer dollars are not going to be used to give inmates a college education when so many people out there are struggling to pay college tuition for their own children. Indiana has a different philosophy and is very progressive compared to Illinois, which came as a big shock to me. Okay, good. I was in the Illinois Department of Corrections, um, convicted of murder and case. Um, I was released in uh, 1987. Um, and during my incarceration, I was part of a group that um, we filed all kind of motions and everything to get um, college classes for the women at the Dwight Correctional Center. Um, they had them for men for many, many years at Viana and all of the other institutions. But they never had them for women, and we were able to do that. And uh, matter of fact, I just did a copy of the, of the case. Um, we got a hold of um, Ben Wolf from the ACLU, and he got us a an attorney, and um, it went to court, and they now have. Um, I actually got my associate's degree from there, and, um, and most of the hours were for my bachelor's degree, and then I was released. Um, but they have all the programs there now from uh, Joliet Junior College is the one that does the associate degree. And uh, their computer program um, does, uh, keeps all the statistics for uh, Stateville, uh, Pontiac, White, uh, and the income and alcohol and the state of all of these. Are um, women at Dwight able to get a bachelor's degree? When, when, did that, when did that start? Because we had a client at Dwight that was not able to take classes. Well, I don't know why. I, I, don't know. I took them. I got my degree. I can show it to you. No, I believe you. But I mean, it, and, it, and they're still able to do that? Well, Dwight no longer exists. No, that's right. Right, right. Because the women are now at Logan Correctional Center. Yeah. And what year were you incarcerated? Well, there, there, there have been significant changes, you know, after you were released. I mean, there, there's, there's this hard line that we're facing now, and so I really am interested in, in what you have to say. Okay, that would be wonderful. Okay, that would be you. wonderful. Um, but things, you know, used to be better, and now we're hearing from our incarcerated clients that things are really bad, especially the men who are at Stateville, Pontiac, and Menard. Well, the men, the men's a whole different right, they're not able to get... And at Menard, they're not able to, and at Stateville. And um, that's interesting. That's wonderful, what you're saying about the women. Absolutely. I mean, that would have helped a great deal. The benefit, I think, for where I was, I had a lot of community connections. I had a lot of different groups that supported me. I mean, um, the Women's Fund of Central Indiana, when I came out, they had a doctor that was willing to see me pro bono. They had a dentist that was willing to see me, an eye doctor. I mean, there's a lot of things that people can volunteer, not just money. I mean, if they just said, hey, you know, I'm a doctor and I'm willing if you get an exoneree to see them within a year, you know, I'll take care of them and give them that checkup or I'm willing to take care of their dental needs. That's a huge help, a huge burden off. I mean, healthcare is a major thing, and I still don't understand it all. But <laughs> I mean, you're getting there, and it's it's so hard. I mean, it doesn't just have to be money. Services, being able to say, hey, you know, I can't give a thousand dollars, but I can take you to your job interview, or I can take you to get an outfit. That's something major. 
in Illinois, if you are convicted, uh, wrongfully convicted in Illinois, when you are released, you can file for what's called a, a petition for a certificate of innocence. And if you are able to prove your actual innocence by a preponderance of the evidence, um, you are entitled to money from the Illinois Court of Claims. And um, this uh, fund, it, it's, it depends on how long you've been incarcerated, but it, for example, Christine's not entitled to this because she was wrongfully convicted in Indiana. But had she uh, been in Illinois, she would probably be entitled to um, a little less than $200,000 that she would receive from the Court of Claims. And again, this is um, a civil process. It's wholly separate from some sort of civil claim that you might file. Uh, in federal court asking for millions of dollars. Um, um, not everybody gets a certificate of innocence. Again, you have to prove your innocence by a preponderance of the evidence, and certainly not everyone is successful with a civil lawsuit. Um, and so um, uh, many times our clients um, who have received a certificate of innocence, it then takes another nine months for the state of Illinois to get the money to them. They know they have about $200,000 that's coming to them, but they need a car now to get to that job, or they need money for an apartment, so they'll take out a loan. And the problem is the interest rates of these loans are usurious. And, um, and so that is it's also another thing that we're thinking about with regards to this not-for-profit being set up. It might be a place where money could be um, uh, given to people, you, you know, non-interest loan. Uh, with this idea that if you do come into money later on, you would be expected to pay it back.